Welcome to On the Lord's Day here on the Gospel Broadcasting Network. My name is Eddie Parrish, and I'm the preacher for the Brown Trail Church of Christ in Bedford, Texas. Bedford is located about halfway between Dallas and Fort Worth. What you're about to watch is a recent worship assembly conducted at our meeting facility in Bedford. Jesus said in John 4, verse 24, God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. At the Brown Trail Church of Christ, that's what we desire to do, is to worship God in spirit and in truth according to His directions in the New Testament. And so I hope that you find our worship assembly today refreshing in its simplicity and in its conformity to the New Testament pattern. If you have any questions about what you see or hear today, we encourage you to contact us. Our address is the Brown Trail Church of Christ, Post Office Box 210667, Bedford, Texas 76095. Or if you'd like to send us an email, our address is office at Brown Trail Church of Christ. Dot com. Thank you for being with us today. Oh Lord, our God. Dear Lord, we praise your name for the many blessings that we have in this life, the physical things of this life, such as our homes and our cars and um, the food we have to eat. Help us to never take for granted these blessings. We've been blessed as a nation, and we pray that our, our lives are a reflection of, of the thankfulness that we have towards you. and all the blessings you give to us, dear Lord. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for the many things that we don't do what we should be doing, the things we leave out in life, in our everyday lives, such as prayer or thanksgiving. We ask for forgiveness for the sin in our lives, and we pray that that sin in our lives does not hinder our prayer to you. We, we thank you for this church family and the closeness of this church family how we care for each other's children, and for each other's grandchildren, for each other's parents and grandparents. And we pray as we walk down the narrow path that leads to eternal salvation, we pray that we can hold each other's hands through encouragement, through love, through uh, admonishment, uh, through study, and through patience. We ask that you watch over us and help us to have an ability to, to make good decisions. Several in our family are hurting today. We pray for, the, for Catherine's family and what they're going through, this young lady that has passed away to cancer. We pray for uh, Sharon Washburn and her parents, Maxie and Fran, and the rest of their family, as they've been struck by cancer as well. Lord, we pray specifically for a cure to cancer and the cure to things like Alzheimer's and leukemia and all the many diseases that each one of us have been affected by. And if that cure doesn't come, dear Lord, help us to remember that our comfort level on this earth uh, does not affect your will. Help us to remember that through peace in our lives and through hope and through the knowledge of the grace that you provide us through Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask for uh, 
prayers on behalf of Audrey Kim McKim as, uh, in the hip surgery that Audrey's having this week. We ask that you be with Nancy Coggins and uh, we ask that you be with Harold as he recovers from heart surgery this past week. Be with them and their families and also the people that are caring for them. We pray for Eddie this morning as he talks to us about evangelism. We ask that you speak through him, through his diligent study of this subject of, and of your holy word. We pray that we can all uh, benefit from the study that he does and, and our own study. We thank you for his ability to, to stand up here and so simply explain your word, how it should affect our lives and how it does affect our lives. Lord, we ask for guidance in our own lives and we pray for uh, the ability to do better and the willpower to say no to sin and say no to the many things of this world. We pray for our leadership at this church body and we ask that you watch over those elders and the deacons that are working on our behalf. We pray for uh, our worship service this morning as we're about to partake of the, uh, the emblems that represent Jesus' body. Pray that our hearts and minds are in the right place they need to be this morning. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ and his, his walk to the cross, his death on the cross, his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. And we pray for this opportunity on this first day of the week to, to come together as a church body to remember that and to try to make ourselves better through that knowledge, and through the joy that we have that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the creator of all things. It's through him that we approach you in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Show me the friends and neighbors and visitors would like to let you know that the first Sunday of each month the elder that has the duty presents to the congregation a very brief talk to remind us of how extremely important what we're about to partake of is that is the Lord's Supper I want to try to approach it this morning from a little different point of view There were a number of different groups that were witnessing the crucifixion of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are here this morning to remember a sinless man who died a sinner's death for you and for me. As we talk about these groups, have you ever thought, if I had been there, which of the groups would I have fit into? Would you have lined yourself with some of these that were simply awful? First, would you have been with the religious elite of the day? The chief priests and the scribes, the elders who yelled, crucify him. Are we saying when we fail to properly partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week as we've been commanded? Number two, there was Peter who followed at a distance and three times he had already denied the Lord that even knew him. Do we deny the Lord when we fail to properly meet at the Lord's table each first day of the week? Hebrews 10.25 admonishes us when it says, 
not forsaking of the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 10, 26, the very next verse, says, if we sin willfully after we have received the truth, there remains no other sacrifice for us. Jesus is not going to the cross again, brethren. Number three, there was Simon the Cyrene who was compelled to, crawl, to carry the cross for Jesus. Not because Jesus was a weakling, but he'd been beaten so severely and so mistreated that he was just exhausted. You know, we're said, it's said for us that we are commanded to take up our cross daily and follow him. Number four, the evil Roman soldiers were there. They stripped Jesus, placed a crown of thorns on his head, pushed them down on his bleeding brow. You ever stick your finger with just a little rose thorn? How bad does that hurt? Think about the pain that Jesus suffered for you and for me. And then those same soldiers drove nails through his flesh, hanging him to the cross. Then number five is there were a group of people there. It was in Luke 23, 35 through 37. They are just called the people that were nearby. They were perhaps the onlookers that gather at any crime or excitement today. They were the very ones that walked by and taunted Jesus, saying, Thou destroyest the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. But Paul said, I am not ashamed to own my Lord. Then next there were the two thieves on the cross, one on the right and one on the left. <laughs> Number six. In studying this, we notice that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the disciple who Jesus loved, John, were evidently pretty near because they could hear Jesus say, Woman, behold thy son. And to the disciple, Behold thy mother. Then there were other women who were far off, perhaps for modesty's sake, because what they were witnessing was a terrible scene. There was also evidently very nearby Joseph of Arimathea. He was a wealthy, devout Israelite, a member of the Sanhedrin, and he's the one that went and begged for the body of Jesus. It's observed that uh, when the condemnation was over and, the, and the, the fake trials, that Joseph had taken no part. But he realized that he was not courageous. So what did he do? After the crucifixion, he went and begged Pilate for Jesus' body. Mark 15, 45. Joseph had a garden close to Calvary where he had honed a smooth and polished tomb for preparation for his own burial. But Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, owner of the whole world, was placed in that borrowed tomb. This should give us this morning an epitome of evil. How cruel can man be to man? And how unthoughtful they can be towards God. This makes me think of what group would we have been in at the time. This had been a terrible time. A terrible sight. And if we don't watch ourselves, it would cause us to be despondent. But praise the Lord, we have a sequel. Christ did not stay in that barred tomb. Hallelujah, he arose. 
he arose and since he promised he would not drink of no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that he drinks it in the kingdom of God. We are here this morning to remember the greatest memorial that has ever occurred. Oh what? There is another group. We're part of that group. We have assembled here as committed on the first day of the week to remember Jesus. What can we say? Thank you, Lord, for Jesus the Christ, our Lord and our Master. Now, very humbly and with great reverence, may we now partake of the Lord's Supper. Merciful Father in heaven, with complete humility of heart, we approach your throne, understanding that it is inconceivable what our Lord and Savior went through for each one of us. As we take our minds back to that moment in time when he went before that howling mob, yielded his life in the cruelest manner possible, we stand in awe of your great love, of the love, great love that Christ had for us and has for us, knowing that this sacrifice was the only way. Father, it's, it's beyond our, our comprehension, such love, such great love for us to endure that kind of suffering, that kind of pain, to give that kind of sacrifice for us. Father, we, we are so thankful for your son. At this time, Father, we gather around this table. We ask that you would bless this bread that represents that sinless, perfect body given in our stead. In Jesus' name, amen. What the church is doing right now is partaking of the Lord's Supper. Jesus instituted this observance on the very night that he was betrayed by Judas. At a gathering with his apostles, Jesus took two Passover food items, unleavened bread and grape juice, and told his apostles to eat the bread and drink the juice, this time with new meaning, as symbols of his body and blood. Listen to Matthew's account of this event. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. Then, in the very next verse, Matthew 26, 29, Jesus told his disciples that he would not observe this memorial again with them until the kingdom was established. When the kingdom, also known as the church, came into existence in Acts 2, the disciples began to observe this memorial regularly, Acts 2.42. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 reveals how regularly on the first day of the week. And so with those passages from the New Testament as our authority, we observe this memorial to Jesus Christ every first day of the week. Heavenly Father, as we continue this memorial, we partake of this fruit of the vine which represents that blood that was shed for our sins. May we never forget the pain and suffering he went through on our behalf, but he rose so we can have that home Hope of heaven with you one day. Through Christ I pray. Amen. According to the New Testament, the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper involves more than remembering Jesus and the sacrifice he made for us. It also involves some personal examination. Take note of Paul's inspired instruction to the church in Corinth. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 26 to 28. As the church continues this memorial observance today, we're not only thinking about what Jesus has done for us, we're also thinking about ourselves. We're looking deep within our hearts and lives to see if we've been living in harmony with God's will. We're considering whether or not our lives reveal how grateful we are for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And so this is a valuable time each week for the Christian. We gratefully remember Jesus and we humbly examine ourselves. Holy Father, we're so thankful that we have the opportunity of this worship service. We're so thankful that we have the ability not only to prepare for our own families, but also that we have the abundance to share with others. We're thankful for all of the things that Thou has done and has provided for us. We, we thank Thee for the funds this morning for which we contribute. We pray that You will be with those who have the responsibility of the distribution of these funds. May it be done in such a way that it is in an acceptable manner unto Thee. It is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. No. went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted, and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Our world in a lot of ways is so vastly different from the world of the first century. That's true in a lot of ways and not the least of which are matters that pertain to technological advances, certainly medical advances. All kinds of things uh, are so much different. But in other ways, they're not really different at all. If you think about basic human needs, and if you think especially about spiritual matters, there is one particular way in which there is no difference between today and then. That is that every soul that lived then and every person that lives today has as a part of them a spiritual component that will spend eternity in one of two places. We are no different today in that respect than they were then. There's something else that's unchanged in that regard. And that is if the church of the Lord does not engage in evangelism, the disseminating of the gospel message. If the church does not do that, no one else is going to. And when I say the church, that's you and me. If Christians are not involved in that process, really think about it. Who else is going to do it? 
False religion? Well, by definition, they're not. The world? Well, obviously not. It's up to us to do our part. Now, what, what specific and individual roles we as individuals play in that process is going to differ from person to person because we have different talents, different abilities, and therefore expectations um, are, are different in the sense of or in the realm of how we are engaged in the process. But still, each of us has a role to play in evangelism. We've begun a series of lessons that we're calling Building Up the Body. And in this series, we're going to highlight different ways in which we can build up the body of Christ. And we're going to look at ways in which we can build ourselves up as individuals and grow spiritually ourselves. And we're going to talk about ways in which the body uh, as a corporate group can be built up and increased in number as well as in strength. And today we look at evangelism. But we're not going to look at evangelism today in the sense of programs. I'm not going to, to present to you today a new evangelistic program to, uh, to be utilized within the congregation. Generally speaking, I think the Lord's church has enough evangelistic programs. I don't think we're lacking programs problem somewhere else, and that's what I want to address today. Programs will only work when our hearts are in them. And today I want for us to look at the heart of Jesus. You want to look at heart that will make us evangelistic Got to look at the heart of Jesus. Let's begin to do that this morning. First of all, the heart of Jesus was a heart of compassion. The heart of Jesus was a heart of compassion. Look back at our text in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 specifically. But when he saw the multitudes... He was moved with compassion for them. Moved with compassion. Three words in English coming from a singular Greek word that had as its root something that may surprise you. The basic root form of the word in the Greek language, translated moved with compassion in English, has to do with, if I may step aside for a moment, has to do with the abdominal organs. I know you don't have any problem seeing this. <laughs> Talk about big visual aids. All right. The Greek word is splankna. The Latin equivalent is viscera. That may mean a little more to us because the Latin term has found its way into English more so than the Greek term has. But it all has to do with, initially and originally, the abdominal organs. And the Greek lexicons tell us that this word, quote, describes no ordinary pity or compassion, but an emotion which moves a man to the very depths of his being. 
It is the strongest word in Greek for the feeling of compassion, end quote. Now again, the Greek term hasn't found its way into the English language like its Latin equivalent has. You ever heard someone speak of visceral emotions? You ever heard someone reference perhaps when someone comes upon a very grisly or distressing scene and they say, she let out a visceral scream? It comes from that word and it has to do with emotions that hit us in the very pits of our stomachs. That's how the word has developed over time. That's how it began as simply a reference to the abdominal organs. It came to be used in this sense of deep felt passion, deep felt compassion, deep felt emotions of various kinds because they were emotions that struck people in the very depths of their being. If you've ever been in a situation where you have felt a sense of pity or sympathy or some kind of emotion that you essentially and literally felt it in your stomach, that's what Jesus felt when he saw people. And that's why I say what we lack in the church is not a good evangelistic program. We lack this. Jesus looked out at the multitudes and it hit him right in the depths of his stomach. He was moved with compassion, a visceral response. But that's not the only time and the only place where it says Jesus was moved this way. Before we finish this morning, I want you to look at some other passages. While you're there in Matthew, turn over to chapter 14. And look at verse 14. And when Jesus went out, He saw a great multitude, and He was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Same word. Chapter 15, verse 32. Now Jesus called His disciples to Himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with Me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 41. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out His hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. This said to a man with leprosy. Back to Matthew for just a moment. Chapter 20. Verse 34, two blind men, Jesus says to them, or it says of Jesus, so Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed Him. One more, Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verse 13. When the Lord saw her, this being the widow from the town of Nain, who was about to bury her only son, when the Lord saw her, He had compassion on her and said to her, 
do not weep. What was it about Jesus or what was it about these individuals that brought about this visceral emotion from Jesus? Look at the text. Let it tell you. First of all, from Matthew 9, our original text, verse 36. He saw people who were weary and scattered. Those words mean, first of all, weary means harassed, bullied, oppressed. Scattered literally means to be thrown aside or thrown down. Jesus looked out and he saw people who had been bullied, harassed, and thrown down. People that had been beaten up. Like sheep without a shepherd. No guidance. No nourishment. No protection. No provision. When Jesus looked at the multitudes, that's what he saw. And it got him deep within his heart. The text in Matthew 14 and 15 that we looked at, what was it that brought about this visceral response? People's hunger, concern for their well-being. So these people have been following me for three days and haven't eaten a thing. I don't want them fainting when they go home. It moved him. Chapter 20, verse 34, Matthew, that we looked at, two blind men. It moved him. A man with a communicable disease, leprosy, Mark chapter 1, it moved him. The widow who was in the middle of a funeral procession for her own son, it moved him. The heart of Jesus, he was moved by the lost condition of people. He was moved by the hunger and pain of his fellow man. And he was deeply moved by the sorrow of other people. We don't need more programs. And I'm not against programs. I just think we have enough of them at our disposal if we'd use them. What we often lack is the heart of Jesus. I want to say more about that heart tonight. That it was not just a heart of compassion, but it was a heart of action. Let us try to develop that heart, and I hope to give you some ideas tonight that will help us to do exactly that. But you may already realize in your own life that the heart of Jesus has not touched you like it should. And if you realize that, I hope you'll take steps today, whatever they are, to make sure that you have responded properly to Him. And so if you have not yet embraced Him as Savior by trusting Him, by repenting of your sins, confessing Him and being immersed in water, to have your sins washed away by His blood. If you haven't done that, I encourage you to do it. Many of you I know have, yet maybe through the passage of time you've lost your heart. And you realize that your heart's not in it anymore. Well, if that's you, then start today to change your heart. Recognize and admit that the problem is there, seek God's forgiveness and help and He'll grant it to you. And if we might be of assistance to you in doing that this morning, please come while we stand and sing together. Father in heaven, we're thankful, O oh Father, for 
this time that we now have to come together as a congregation. We come, O oh Father, thanking you for your son, Jesus, who on that windswept hill so long ago, that the cross was lifted up bearing his body with the nails and the drub dripping. We're thankful, O oh Father, for his great and supreme sacrifice for men for all time and everywhere. We're thankful, O oh Father, for the Holy Church that he instituted, that all peoples may come in thereat and have salvation. We're thankful, O oh Father, for our nation. We ask and pray that we may truly be a, be a beacon of freedom and of love. We pray for our president. We pray for our members of Congress. We pray for our Supreme Court, knowing that they must make governmental decisions that will not only affect our lives, but the lives of generations yet unborn. We know, Father, there are many among us who are experiencing illness. We ask and pray that they may be cured of their illness if it is within the bounds of your will, that they may be able to regain their rightful health and go about their normal daily activities. We pray that as we go from this place, from this appointed time of worship, be with us in everything that we do. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us on the Lord's Day. If you have any questions about what you have seen or heard today during our worship assembly, please contact us. The Brown Trail Church of Christ, Post Office Box 210667, Bedford, Texas 76095. If you'd like to email us, that address is office at browntrailchurchofchrist.com. I hope and pray that God will richly bless you until we see you again on the Lord's Day. Let's forget about ourselves.